Don't live luxuriously on your husband's money. The comment from my mother-in-law Wendy freezes the atmosphere at the 60th birthday celebration I organized for my mom. In the midst of this, all right, let's split the bill then. My usually calm mom says. Wendy looks stunned and lets out a confused. Huh? My name is Layla, and I'm 37 years old. I quit my full-time job when I got married two years ago and now work part-time while supporting my husband, Walker. Life was great until last month when we started living with Wendy. The reason? My father-in-law passed away. He died of cancer three months ago. Leaving Wendy to live alone. Wendy felt scared and lonely living by herself, so we moved into Walker's family home. Before we got married, Walker had told me. I'm an only child, so I'll have to take care of my parents. I want to be there for them, especially if they need caregiving. Wendy is a kind person. So I agreed to live with her in the future, even offering to help with caregiving. She never interfered in our marriage. And she was a great homemaker when my father-in-law was alive. I respected her and thought I was lucky to have such a good mother-in-law. So, we started living together earlier than planned, and I was looking forward to a happy life as a family of three. But I never expected Wendy to turn out the way she did. A month into living together, we started to feel more comfortable around each other. Hey Layla, I want to eat hamburgers for dinner tonight. Can you make some? I often get dinner requests like this. Sure, let's have hamburgers for dinner tonight. Some mothers-in-law apparently won't eat anything their daughters-in-law cook, but Wendy enjoys my cooking. She never complains about my cleaning or laundry either. Making it easy for me to manage the household. I'm really glad we're living together, Layla. She even says, making me feel fulfilled. It makes me happy to be praised by someone I respect. However, I sometimes wonder why Wendy doesn't do any housework. She praises me but never lifts a finger herself. She leaves her dishes in the sink and doesn't even take her trash out. It's like living with a traditional dad. On top of that, if you eat sweets, leave the garbage on the spot. When I clean, I find crumbs everywhere presumably from snacks Wendy has eaten. Wendy lives on the inheritance and survivor benefits from my late father-in-law. Walker gave all the inheritance to Wendy, saying, My mom put up with my dad's whims all her life. I didn't quite understand, but it's not my place to get involved in their financial matters. As long as they're both okay with it, I thought it was fine. But when Wendy spends her days doing nothing, Living off my late father-in-law's inheritance and survivor benefits, it starts to bother me. I wish she'd at least clean up after herself. She used to be so good at housework when my father-in-law was alive. Why has she become so careless now? Curious, I gently ask Wendy about it. My husband was a very strict man and I couldn't defy him. Now that he's gone, I'm finally free. It turns out my father-in-law was a henpecked husband, and Wendy felt she couldn't go against him. I remember how he used to sit still during meals, ordering Wendy around. Was that what it was? Now I understand what Walker meant. And I can't help but feel sorry for Wendy. I'll take care of the housework from now on. I decide, considering Wendy's feelings. But then, Wendy starts making more and more demands. Can you take a day off from your part-time job today? I want you to drive me to my friend's place. I can't take a day off. I firmly decline. And then she says, Is your pocket money that important to you? Excuse me? I can't believe what I'm hearing. Spending money. I work part-time for the family, not for pocket money. Considering we've just started living together and will continue to do so. I don't voice my complaints. Hey, we're out of milk. 
Can you go buy some now? I can't start my day without milk. Can't you see I'm about to leave for work? If you hurry, you won't be late. Hey Layla, my trash can is full. Take it out, and while you're at it, vacuum and mop my room. It's getting dirty. Wendy starts taking advantage of my willingness to do housework without complaining. This is too much. I gently tell Wendy what I can't do. I'm telling you to do it, so do it. Why can't you? She gets furious. I'm at my wit's end. And decide to consult Walker. Seriously? I'm sorry. Walker apologizes and immediately scolds Wendy. Mom, you should take care of yourself. Unlike Layla, who works part-time, you're home all day. But Wendy just brushes it off. Yeah, yeah, I get it. She clearly doesn't. I start to feel uneasy about this living arrangement. Walker seems to sense my feelings. I'll take care of Mom as much as I can. If there's anything I can do, just let me know. I feel relieved by Walker's words. And true to his word, Walker starts dealing with Wendy's whims. But Wendy isn't happy about it. Why is Walker doing this? Layla, as his wife, you should be the one doing these things. Walker is the breadwinner, and you're just a part-timer. You think it's okay to make a tired Walker do this? Come on, Layla, wash my dishes right now. At this, Walker is furious. Hey, Mom. Stop making Layla do everything. If you're going to talk like that, shouldn't you, who does nothing all day, be the one doing the housework? He has a point. But Wendy is angered by Walker's words. What are you talking about? Your father always told me, a wife must take care of the family, a wife must obey her husband. Now that he's gone, I'm not anyone's wife, and I'm the head of this household. That means Layla, as your wife, should be taking care of me. Is Wendy still bound by my father-in-law's words? I can't hold back and argue with her. Wendy, times have changed. These days, no one thinks that way about wives and husbands. You need to change your mindset. Walker nods in agreement. But Wendy's face turns red with anger. What are you saying? Are you calling me outdated? How dare you, as a wife, say such terrible things to me? I'm shocked. Then Wendy continues to vent her anger at me. The only reason I taught you how to do housework was so you could do it all when we lived together. I agreed to live with you because I wanted an easier life after all the hardships I've endured. Even Walker is surprised by her revelation. Look, I get that you've had it tough, Mom, but it's not okay to treat Layla like a slave. And it's not okay to move in with us for such a selfish reason. Exactly. Wendy has no comeback. Enough! I'm disappointed that you're siding with her over your own mother. She storms off to her room and slams the door. Walker and I sigh. Layla, I'm really sorry. You don't want to live like this, do you? I nod slightly. Then comes a surprising suggestion. Should we stop living together? What? I never thought he'd suggest that. I didn't expect mom to become so selfish after dad passed away. But we can't keep living like this. Let's move. I'm happy to hear this. But moving now is a concern. In fact, my mom's 60th birthday celebration is just around the corner, and I'm the one organizing it. I've just bought an expensive gift for her, wanting to give something special back to the woman who raised me. Moving would be another big expense. When I mention this, Walker also looks troubled. Plus, 
we've just moved here, and Walker's savings have taken a hit. Moving now would be difficult. But we can't put up with Wendy anymore. We ponder what to do but can't find an answer. In the end, we put the moving idea on hold. And so, we continue to endure Wendy's whims and clashes. The stress is piling up, and we're both exhausted. In the midst of this, my mom's 60th birthday celebration is approaching. It's next month, huh? As Walker and I discuss the celebration, Wendy joins the conversation. What's happening next month? We proceed to explain. So, please have dinner alone that day. I'll prepare the meal for you. When I said that, Wendy, as usual, made a selfish demand. I'm coming too! You're coming too? I couldn't understand why Wendy, who had only met my mom a few times, would say that. Walker seemed to feel the same and asked her, a bit annoyed. Hey, why would you come, mom? It's for Layla's mom's 60th birthday celebration. Then came an incomprehensible reply. Well, I never got a 60th birthday celebration from Layla. So, you should celebrate me too. What? Neither of us could make sense of it. Wendy is 63, and when we first met, she was already past 60. Yet, she's demanding a celebration? Walker couldn't understand her logic either and kept arguing. This is ridiculous. But Wendy wouldn't budge, insisting. I'm going. Celebrate me too. So, they kept arguing. This was getting nowhere. Fine. If my mom agrees, then Wendy can come too. I called my mom. Would it be okay if Walker's mom also joins the 60th birthday celebration? My mom graciously said. Sure. Yay! Then I'm coming to the 60th birthday celebration. Ugh. This is turning into a hassle. Walker and I exchanged glances, both probably thinking the same thing. But we had no idea what was coming. Little did we know that Wendy's selfishness would escalate even more on this particular day. On the day of the 60th birthday celebration. We headed to my parents' house by train. Why are we taking the train, Layla? What happened to the car? I hate trains. My mom loves her alcohol. And the plan was for everyone to drink. That's why we couldn't drive. When I explained, Wendy looked displeased. Well, you could just abstain from drinking, Layla. I'll drink your share too. So get off the train now and go rent a car. I can't do that. My mom is looking forward to drinking with me. I said, refusing her demand. She kept grumbling. It's not like the train ride was that long. It's only about 20 minutes from our house to my parents. Despite feeling embarrassed by her loud complaints on the train, Walker and I finally arrived at my parents' home. We were greeted by my mom, who then said hello to Wendy. Layla is always in your care. I hope she's not causing any trouble. Wendy laughed and responded in a way that was completely out of line. Ha ha ha. She's always a handful. She does the housework I've taught her, but she's so busy trying to make extra money that she sometimes doesn't listen. But hey, she's the wife Walker brought home. Walker immediately scolded Wendy. Mom. What are you saying? My mom and I were stunned. Ignoring that she wasn't even a family member, Wendy led the way into the house. You're having a hard time living with her, aren't you? My mom whispered this to me so Wendy couldn't hear. I could only respond with a wry smile. When we got to the living room, the catering we had ordered was already there. I had told my mom, You don't have to do any of the serving or cleaning. So Walker and I started setting the table. Why are you making Walker do this? 
You should do it yourself. I couldn't believe she would say something like that here, too. Walker was visibly frustrated. While my mom quietly observed. Wow, this looks delicious. I didn't expect to eat such a feast. I'm glad I came all this way for this 60th birthday celebration. She's a guest in someone else's home, yet she acts like this. Does she have no common sense? The celebration began with a toast. My own father passed away four years ago. Wendy used that as a topic to steer the conversation. Your husband passed away too, right? Isn't life great living off the inheritance and survivor's pension? I've been having a blast since my dad passed. I couldn't believe she could bring up such a topic so casually. I ate my meal with a strained face. Every time Wendy said something inappropriate, Walker would step in, saying, Stop it, Mom! He looked exhausted. We both regretted bringing her along. To say the least. For the record, my mom works and doesn't rely on my dad's inheritance or survivor's pension. She seemed taken aback by Wendy's comments, too. Then the topic shifted to the catering I had ordered. So, this is delicious, but how much did it cost? Was it expensive? Like $200 or $300? Another tone-deaf comment. Just as I was getting fed up, Wendy suddenly became angry. You know, it's fine to celebrate your mom's 60th birthday, but doing it with Walker's money isn't right. Use your own spending money. What is she talking about all of a sudden? I paid for this catering from my own part-time job earnings. But Wendy wouldn't listen. You can't possibly afford such an expensive meal on your measly salary. She even went as far as to say that. Don't be so cheeky, spending your husband's money like that. Why would she say such a thing during my mom's 60th birthday celebration? I deeply regret bringing Wendy along. I can't forgive her for creating this atmosphere. I was about to lose my patience and tell Wendy off when, at that moment. All right, let's go Dutch then. We'll split it four ways. How does that sound? It was my mom who spoke. What? Everyone was shocked. My mom, who had stayed silent every time Wendy made an outrageous comment, was now suggesting this. Wait, what are you saying? Going Dutch on a 60th birthday celebration? That's absurd. Wendy was rattled by my mom's words. In response, my mom spoke confidently. Layla has explained multiple times that she paid for this with her own money, right? But Wendy, you wouldn't accept that, insisting it must be Walker's money. So, I thought going Dutch would settle this. Wendy was speechless. My mom continued. Oh, and Wendy, please pay with your own money, not the money left by your late husband. At this, Wendy became furious. What? Why do I have to be told that by you? Facing Wendy's red-faced, loud outburst, my mom responded calmly. Well, you did say, don't indulge in luxuries with your husband's money, didn't you? So, it would be wrong to use your late husband's inheritance, right? Fair point. Wendy had nothing to say. But she was so furious that she started to say something ridiculous. Well, it's fine for me. But not for Layla. Because Layla is using my precious Walker's hard-earned money. If a wife spends it carelessly, of course a parent would get angry. She's talking nonsense. Walker and I exchanged incredulous glances. I get it, I really do. I'm angry too. I'm frustrated that my dear daughter is being unfairly scolded by Wendy. At this, Wendy seemed at a loss for words, struggling to come up with a retort. Um, well, you see. Stuttering and flustered, Wendy was silenced by my mom's next words. Initially, 
I was going to let it slide, watching you berate Layla. I didn't want to cause any issues in your future living arrangements. But enough is enough. You're the one living lavishly on your husband's money, and you dare tell my daughter not to do the same? Are you kidding me? How can you demean and belittle my daughter in front of me? What would you think if I did the same to Walker right now? Wendy was completely silenced. I never knew my mom could get this angry. Neither Walker nor I could hide our surprise. Wendy, now quiet, seemed regretful and teary-eyed. She grabbed Walker's hand and stood up. Walker, let's go! I can't stay here any longer! For some reason, she tried to leave with Walker. Walker, of course, didn't go with her. He shook off her hand and snapped. How selfish can you be, Mom? Enough is enough! Wendy started to cry. What now? Even you, Walker? Everyone's treating me like the villain. I was thinking of you when... Before she could finish, Walker shouted. Cut the crap! What's for my sake? Apologize to Layla right now for ruining this 60th birthday celebration. Wendy was visibly shaken by Walker's fury. He seemed so forceful that it looked like he might hit her. Perhaps because of that, Wendy complied meekly. Um, I... I'm really sorry. I truly apologize. Wendy offered a heartfelt apology to me and my mom. After all the times she had bossed me around, she was finally apologizing sincerely, so I thought about forgiving her. Yeah, right. I'm sorry, but I can't put up with Wendy's selfishness anymore. Ruining my mom's 60th birthday celebration made me realize that I can't live with this person any longer. Please, let's end this living arrangement. With the atmosphere already tense from my mom and Walker confronting Wendy, I unleashed my pent-up anger. That said, I never thought I'd be able to say all this to Wendy. Wendy was shocked when I suggested we should stop living together. She clung to me with a loud voice. Please don't say we should part ways. I'm truly sorry. I messed up today, but from now on, I'll take care of myself. It's too late for that now. So, as you've said, take care of yourself. In your own home. Also, remember you mentioned not living large on my husband's money? Starting today, you'll need to find a part-time job and earn your own keep. My point was, own up to what you say. Wendy was taken aback. No, no, that was a mistake. I take it back. I didn't mean that part about not using my husband's money. Walker chimed in, a touch of irony in his voice. So, moving forward, Layla can do whatever she wants with my money, right? Exactly. Ah, uh, well, um... Wendy was at a loss for words. I was on the verge of bursting into laughter. Everyone blamed her, and she was clearly out of options. Walker didn't hesitate to lay it out straight. Stop depending on my dad's inheritance, Layla, and me. We'll separate our living arrangement and M.O.M., you need to work. Wendy kept repeating. Impossible. Look, dad's inheritance isn't endless. One day it'll run out. Can you live on just survivor benefits and your own pension? You're not actually planning on depending on my salary, are you? Wendy looked utterly confused. How about working part-time at a subsidiary of my company? Walker made a helpful suggestion. But Wendy kept hesitating, saying, But, no. Then I can't help you. We'll move out soon and cut off all contact. Considering recent events and today, I think it's fair. Wendy panicked at Walker's finality. Fine. I get it. I'll do it. 
just don't cut me off. And that's how Wendy put an end to her freeloading life. So, the disastrous 60th birthday celebration came to an end. We all apologized to MOM and hurried home to start looking for a new place and packing. As soon as we found a new home, we moved. During this time, Wendy was noticeably more considerate, just like when we started living together. She even started helping with the chores. But that didn't mean we could continue living together. Wendy, please reconsider. I'd been saying no every time she asked. Trying to make her reflect on her actions. It seemed Wendy was having regrets about her own behavior. Walker, my husband, had a proposal for her to work at his subsidiary company. If you slack off or are late, I'll hear about it. Plus, it's a subsidiary of the company where my son works. If you screw up, it'll reflect badly on me. He figured a reasonable mom would consider. Basically, Walker was taking control until Wendy couldn't mess up her life anymore. He's a tough cookie, I thought. Days later, Walker told Wendy. I spoke to the factory manager at the subsidiary. You have a job interview. With no escape, Wendy reluctantly went to the interview. She got the job and started working five days a week. Since she had been so lazy before, work seemed pretty hard, and she spent her days off sleeping. As Walker had suspected, her work ethic was quite diligent, lest she ruin her reputation and, by extension, his. Working five days a week made her too tired to make a mess at home, which helped keep the household in order. In the midst of all this, she confided, How long will I be stuck like this at my age? Living alone is lonely. If she hadn't been treating me like a slave, everyone could have been happily living by now. By the way, we had to redo the celebration for my mom's 60th birthday because Wendy had ruined it the first time around. It took some time to save up the money. Of course, Wendy wasn't there. When I proposed to my mom that we redo the 60th birthday celebration, she declined, saying, I appreciate the thought, but it's too expensive. Your feelings are enough. In that case, I said, and decided to prepare a nice meal at home. We had a delightful 60th birthday celebration redo. My mom was overjoyed, and Walker also celebrated with us. Hey, Layla, you're not drinking? Well, actually. That day, my mom saved me from the unpleasant Wendy. They say motherhood is a strength, and it's true. I'd been frustrated and stressed by Wendy, so this event reminded me of how great a mom can be. I want to be a mom who, no matter my age, cherishes her children just like mine does. Kids who play sports sure do eat a lot, don't they? I wonder if that's enough food for them. Yeah, it's not just food, but clothes and tuition fees cost a lot too. That's right. Groceries and tuition fees really add up. And with exams and everything else coming up. That's why, Nancy. I truly appreciate you sending us meat. From Susan's behavior, I began to suspect her true intentions. Surely, Susan wanted cash, not meat or vegetables. I get that. But it's a fact that growing kids costs a lot in food expenses, right? I hinted at my reluctance to provide cash assistance indirectly. Once you start giving cash, it's clear the demands will only continue. Nancy. While food is important, if we had cash, I think we could buy the kids things that would make them even happier. Susan continues to hint at a strong preference for cash. Understood. Let's do this then. We'll scale back on the meat and vegetables and find another way to support you. Trust Nancy to understand, thank you. I look forward to our continued relationship. My name is Nancy, 67 years old. Ever since my husband passed away a few years ago, I've been enjoying a carefree life living alone. One thing I've consistently done every month is to send 20 pounds of local meat and seasonally harvested vegetables from my garden to Robert and his wife, who live in Boston. 
At the beginning of each month, I always call a courier to request delivery of the parcels. When the delivery truck stops in front of my house, and the familiar driver greets me cheerfully, I open the door to welcome him in. Thanks for your hard work in this heat. Please have some coffee before you go. As I offer a chilled coffee from the fridge, the driver smiles genuinely and says, Thank you as always. Your grandchildren must be delighted. The eldest is playing basketball in elementary school. The middle one is good at studying, and the youngest likes baseball. I can't help but smile as I remember my growing grandchildren's happy faces. Though I haven't seen them in a while, just imagining them enjoying the meat and vegetables I send fills me with joy and makes me feel a bit younger. I feel like Robert could at least show me their faces once in a while, but with his managerial position at a large company, it's probably hard for him to find the time to come visit. The package should be delivered by noon tomorrow at the latest. The kids have probably grown so much since I last saw them. Oh, sorry. Please take care of the package. Without showing any concern for my melting smile, the driver left with a refreshing smile. The next evening, just as I returned from shopping, Susan called. Nancy? The package arrived a bit ago. Thank you as always. That's okay. I enjoy doing it. How are the kids? Is everyone healthy? I heard there's been a lot of sickness going around, so make sure you all take care. Since I don't see them often, I end up bombarding her with questions. I always talk too much and then remember to consider the listener's feelings. Oh, sorry. I was about to go on too long again. No, it's okay. On the other end of the phone, Susan answered in a flat voice. Susan hasn't been one to engage much in conversation since she first came to introduce herself before marrying Robert. It's not that she's gloomy, if anything, she prefers rather flashy clothes. But something's been bothering me. Every month after the package arrives, Susan always calls to thank me, but her voice seems to grow more subdued with each call. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but although she says thank you, it doesn't seem heartfelt, like there's no energy in her voice. Susan. We haven't seen each other in a while, but are you okay? You sound down, and I'm concerned. When I asked out of concern, Susan's voice tensed slightly as she said, That's not the case. We're doing just fine. Hearing that, I felt somewhat relieved. But it seemed like her will to continue the conversation was weak, and the next words didn't come easily. How are the kids doing? The oldest is playing basketball, right? Yes, he is. What about it? Susan's response, with a slightly cold tone, made me feel a bit sad. Still, it's probably not my place to worry. I don't send the meat and vegetables each month to be thanked, if it's just for my satisfaction, so be it. I'm just happy imagining the grandchildren enjoying them. Still, it would be nice if she could put a bit more joy into her voice. Doing sports means the kids eat a lot every day, doesn't it? I wonder if what they get is enough. Yeah, it's not just about food, but clothes and tuition fees also require a lot of money. I tried to lighten the mood with a joke, but Susan didn't laugh and responded seriously. I understand that all too well, having raised Robert. Groceries and tuition really do add up. And with exams and all coming up. That's why, Nancy. I truly appreciate the meat you send us, but... Susan seemed to want to expand on the conversation but hesitated to continue, as if finding it difficult to say more. From the way Susan spoke, I began to sense her true intentions. She probably wants cash instead of meat or vegetables. I'm well aware of that. But it's a fact that those growing kids rack up a significant food bill, right? I want to help with that. I indirectly expressed my reluctance to provide cash assistance. Once you start giving cash, it's clear that the demands will only continue. And unlike meat or vegetables, cash can be turned into anything. I want to see the joy on my grandchildren's faces in a tangible form. For that, I believe food is the most effective, not cash. Nancy. Food is important, of course, but with cash, I think we could buy the kids things that would make them much happier. Susan still hints at a strong preference for cash. Usually, Susan doesn't try to speak up much, but this time, she seemed unusually assertive. Understood. Let's do this then. We'll scale back on the meat and vegetables and find another way to support you. 
I avoided direct statements and subtly communicated a change in our support strategy. Susan, with a voice full of vigor, said, Just as I expected from Nancy, thank you. I look forward to our continued relationship. And hung up. Upon reflection, Susan was right. The kids need more than just food. Tuition is a significant expense, and so are writing supplies and clothes. Even though Robert is in a managerial position at a large company, it might not be easy economically to raise growing children. With that thought, instead of financial support through meat and vegetables, I decided to buy and send textbooks, dictionaries, and sports shoes the children might like. A month later, I received another call from Susan. From her tone, low and lacking energy, I immediately sensed it wouldn't be a happy conversation. Nancy. Thank you for the gifts for the kids. Her words conveyed thanks, but it was clear her heart wasn't in it. There was no sense of joy or gratitude, but rather, it felt almost like anger. It's okay. But maybe it wasn't enough? I asked the store clerk for the most popular sneakers for kids these days and bought them, but didn't the kids like them? The first thing that came to my mind was the disappointed faces of my grandchildren. It's not like that at all. Why can't you understand? Susan's voice was laden with emotion, and she made no attempt to hide her anger. But I couldn't understand why Susan was so angry with me. Susan, what's wrong with you? Is there something you're unhappy about? Susan took a deep breath over the phone and said, Listen, Nancy. Don't make me say it over and over. I don't want food or goods, I strictly want cash. When you send those things, their use is already predetermined. Although I had vaguely suspected it, I hadn't expected her to state it so bluntly. I started to worry that there might be some financial troubles in Robert's household. Maybe Robert had made a significant mistake at work and was in a difficult position. Or perhaps he was under so much work-related stress that he had accumulated a large amount of debt and was now trapped in a situation where he couldn't do anything about it. Otherwise, I couldn't think of a reason why Susan would be demanding cash so insistently. If he's a manager at a large corporation, it's hard to imagine them struggling financially under normal circumstances. Are you in some kind of serious situation I don't know about? What does Robert say? As soon as I mentioned Robert's name, Susan started talking faster on the other end. Robert has nothing to do with this. He's busy with work and doesn't want to worry about family matters too much. That's all. While she sounded like a considerate wife worried about her husband, her rapid speech made me feel like she was hiding something she didn't want to be discovered. I see. Let me think a bit more about whether to send goods or cash. I'll try to help in the best way I can. I'm going to hang up now. Avoiding a clear answer, I kept my thoughts vague. Susan kept complaining until the end of the call, but I decided to completely ignore it. In the evening, timing it for when Robert would be finishing work and heading home, I decided to call him. I usually don't call Robert because he's busy with work, but there was something I had to ask this time. Robert must have been surprised to receive an unexpected call from home, answering after just three rings. What's up? It's rare for you to call. Is something wrong? Robert skipped the greetings and immediately asked about my situation. He probably thought I had fallen ill and couldn't move. I'm fine. The doctor even joked I'm good for another 50 years. But I have something important to talk to you about, Robert. After hearing I was fine, I could sense tension in Robert's voice over the phone. Is everything okay with your job? Are you facing any troubles? It took Robert a few seconds to respond, then he started laughing. What's going on? Did someone call you saying I've done something bad? That's got to be a scam. Hearing Robert's words, I was relieved my worries were unfounded. At the same time, I felt my suspicions about Susan growing stronger. Susan called, and she seemed to be struggling with money. But if your earnings are fine, there shouldn't be anything to worry about, right? Is that true? I had no idea. Susan hasn't talked to me about any of this. Robert was also confused, hearing about this from me for the first time. I went on to tell him about how Susan had rejected the meat and vegetables I used to send, and even the stationery, clothes, and sneakers I bought for the grandchildren were not well received. Robert, who had been silent at first, became very serious. 
so that's why we haven't been getting any meat from you. The kids have been complaining about missing your delicious meat. So it was like that. The eldest is playing basketball, right? Are they eating well? The eldest and even the youngest, who recently started baseball. But they complain about the cheap meat Susan buys not being tasty since your meat stopped coming. Knowing the truth from Robert made me decide to verify Susan's intentions. Are you going to be home this Saturday, Robert? Will everyone be there? Evening should be fine. The kids will be home by then. Wait, Mom, you're not planning to come here, are you? That's the plan. Is it inconvenient for you, Robert? No, not at all. Yeah, maybe when the family's all together, we need to have a talk with Susan. Robert readily agreed with my suggestion. On the appointed Saturday, I took the unfamiliar step of flying up to the city. Robert had initially offered to pick me up from the airport, but I declined, thinking it would alert Susan, and took a taxi to their house instead. After pressing the doorbell, Hello? A woman's cheerful response came, and the front door opened. Good evening, Susan. It's been a while. As soon as she saw my face, Susan's expression froze. She seemed to be frantically pondering in her mind whether to accept the sudden appearance of me. May I come in, even though it's quite sudden? That would be. I need to consult with Robert first, it would be troublesome. Susan stood in my way, blocking entry, but Robert came out from the hallway and said, Good to see you, Mom. Come on in. Noticing brand name women's shoes at the shoe cabinet. How much did these shoes cost? I murmured quietly under my breath. As the barrier Susan set up easily crumbled, she hurried into the living room. I changed into the slippers Robert offered and quickly followed Susan. Entering the living room, I couldn't believe my eyes. A luxurious chandelier hung from the ceiling, shining brightly, and brand name bags were scattered carelessly on shelves and sofas. The sofa and table were also stylish, made by famous international designers. They did not look like a household struggling financially. Susan, having had everything seen, was now frantically trying to hide the branded items around the house. Robert's earnings should be sufficient for such luxuries. So why did Susan want cash? I tilted my head in an exaggerated manner, and Robert joined in. Seems like Susan's unhappy with what I make. He glared at Susan. Susan, clearly shaken and finding no way out, finally snapped. That's right, it's not enough. Is that so bad? It costs that much to be a mother. She raised her voice defiantly. You wouldn't be short if you didn't insist on buying brand name stuff. We'd have more than enough if we lived normally. Robert retorted angrily. In response, Susan, without any sign of remorse, glared back at Robert. Robert might not understand this, but in the world of mom friends, keeping up appearances is essential. If you don't show you're at least a bit well off, you'll be ridiculed by everyone. To avoid that, you can't skimp on spending money on brand names. If something is popular, you have to buy it right away, and for dinner parties, you have to choose slightly more upscale restaurants or you'll be laughed at behind your back by your mom friends. Even now, it's nowhere near enough. I should be going to beauty salons to take care of my skin, and clothes from last year are already out of fashion, I need new ones soon. But then there's Robert talking about saving for the future and for the kids, making it impossible for me to have any freedom with the money. So you plan to deceive mom to get money? Deceiving? That makes it sound like I committed fraud. No, I just wanted Nancy's help. What's wrong with that? Susan had completely become defiant. It's clear now that you only thinks about yourself. What a lonely person. I spat out, and Susan glared at me with a look full of anger. Huh? I'm explaining how tough the world is, and you still don't get it? Are you keeping up with the times? Or is your mind starting to go? Are you okay, Nancy? Susan freely insulted me, then sighed deeply. If anything, I'm the victim here. Selling all that heavy meat you kept sending, considering the shipping costs and conversion, it's been incredibly difficult. And with such small earnings already. Susan was reselling the meat mom sent? 
What kind of person does that? Robert held his head in dismay while Susan awkwardly admitted, I only sold a little, most of it went to feeding the kids. And no one wants to buy stationery or textbooks, it's tough. Well, the sneakers were popular, I could have sold them, but the kids wouldn't let go. Of course. You were even willing to sell the things our children cherish. Then, the three grandchildren who had been playing in another room came out, having heard their parents arguing. That's right. Mom was terrible. She tried to sell the shoes Grandma bought us while we were at school. Yeah. It's only because I took them to school to show my friends that they weren't sold. The grandchildren clung to me, their innocent eyes shining as they made their plea. Robert and I were completely dismayed by Susan's actions. All this time, Mom has been helping with the kids' tuition. I said my salary was enough to get by, but she insisted on saving it for the kids' future. Susan has taken Mom's kindness for granted. I won't forgive you if you don't apologize to Mom. This was the first time I witnessed Robert expressing such raw anger. The fact he was doing it not for himself, but for me, warmed my heart. Ugh. I've had enough. Why should I have to apologize? Not being ridiculed by mom friends is for the kids' benefit too, why can't anyone understand that? Screaming, Susan started throwing any brand name bags scattered around at me and Robert. Robert protected me and the children, leading us out of the living room. It's come to this, there's only one set of people we can rely on now. Let's call them. Robert took out his mobile phone and made a call. It was clear from the conversation that he was calling Susan's parents. Yes, it would be a great help if you could come right now. We'll be waiting. I hadn't seen Susan's parents since the birth of their third grandchild and never imagined a reunion under these circumstances. In less than 30 minutes, Susan's parents arrived, rushing over in a taxi. As Robert opened the door to greet them, they headed straight for the living room with heavy steps. Susan, with her face flushed red, was throwing anything she could grab and resting when tired before starting again. She seemed to have lost control, acting in despair. What on earth is Susan doing as an adult? Susan stopped her tantrum only when she heard her dad, Brian, yelling. After Robert and I explained the situation to Susan's parents, they seemed shocked at first but understood everything after seeing the state Susan was in and the brand name bags. Robert, Nancy, I'm so sorry for all the trouble our selfish Susan has caused. Susan's mom, Emily, deeply apologized, while Susan, tears in her eyes, bit her lip in frustration, feeling misunderstood by everyone. Why is everyone trying to stop me? I just wanted to buy what I wanted, just wanted to show off to my mom friends. Earn your own money before you say such things. I won't allow you to trouble Robert and Nancy any further. Brian scolded Susan, and Emily followed. The responsibility for Susan's selfishness lies with us, her parents. We'll correct her vanity and wasteful habits. And she made a firm promise. Brian grabbed Susan by the scruff of her neck. We're taking you home to correct your twisted values. If that doesn't work, you can't complain if you end up divorced. Brian said this looking at Robert, who simply nodded in agreement. It seemed Robert's feelings for Susan had completely cooled, to the point where the idea of divorce did not provoke any resistance. Susan kept hurling insults at me and Robert until her parents took her away. Then, from somewhere, the sound of rumbling stomachs was heard. Turning around, the grandchildren were rubbing their bellies. Grandma, I'm hungry. Remembering that we hadn't had dinner yet, I rolled up my sleeves. Then, tonight Grandma will cook. I brought some vegetables with me. Opening the fridge, it was apparent Susan had been neglecting meals, with hardly any food inside. Still, using what was available, I managed to make three dishes with years of housewife experience. Wow, Grandma, you're like a magician. Seeing how the grandchildren enjoyed my cooking, I decided to move in and take Susan's place in this household. Robert had no objections, and the grandchildren were overjoyed. Yay! Having Grandma's cooking every day is the best. Michael said. While we were eating, I asked the grandchildren about what kind of mom Susan had been, and the answers were astonishing. Susan had been skimping on expenses for the grandchildren to save more money for herself. 
I wanted a new notebook, but mom wouldn't buy it for me. I started playing baseball, but she wouldn't buy me a glove. The grandchildren had a lot of grievances against their self-serving mom. Robert stopped eating, put down his chopsticks, and apologized to his children. I'm sorry. If I had realized, I wouldn't have allowed mom's selfishness. I made you suffer. Dad, you don't have to apologize. It's all mom's fault. The grandchildren's kindness towards their dad moved me, and I couldn't help but tear up. Grandma, are you crying? Not at all. Just something in my eye. I said, trying to brush it off. Later, under her parents' watch, Susan attempted one last act of defiance. Tell Grandma and Dad to forgive me. If you don't help Mom, I'll make sure you're ambushed at school and suffer. She sent threatening emails to her children. Learning this, Robert was understandably furious. After discussing with his children, he decided. I have decided to divorce Mom. What will you do? We'll stay with Dad. We can't live with Mom like this. Besides, Grandma buys us everything we need and makes us lots of delicious food, so we don't need Mom. Thus, Robert and Susan officially divorced. Susan became widely known among her mom friends as the wife who was abandoned by her children and husband for her wastefulness. However, Susan's parents always cooperated with us gladly, and the grandchildren continued to open their hearts to them. They sometimes secretly visited to buy the grandchildren their favorite books without telling Susan. Meanwhile, Susan, now unable to show her face in public, covered her face with sunglasses and a mask, spending her days lurking around the elementary school her children attended. I'm their mom. What's the problem with waiting in front of the school? Susan retorted defiantly to the suspicious school staff, but upon learning this, Robert became furious again. How shameless can Susan be? Try pulling a stunt like stalking again. I'll report it to the police immediately. I've already informed the school to do the same. He was uncompromising. Don't do that. If I can't see the kids, how am I supposed to live from now on? Susan wailed, but it was her own fault for ending up in this situation. Fed up with Susan's persistent calls, Robert eventually blocked her number. I've been chosen as the captain for the next basketball tournament. Congratulations, that's wonderful. Then, Grandma must make a special lunchbox and go watch your game. I scored 100 on my next test. It's all thanks to the easy-to-understand textbook you bought me. Well, then, I must prepare a feast tonight. The grandchildren smiled broadly. Grandma, we love you. They hugged my waist. I hugged my three precious treasures tightly.